question. How many of you would like this morning to hear a short sermon? <laughs> question. If it were so, Would eight or nine words suffice? No? Yes. <laughs> so here is one sermon. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all Jonah said. Eight words. And following that proclamation, according to the text, we are told that every man, woman, and child responded by turning from their evil ways, proclaiming a fast, putting on sackcloth and ashes as a sign of their repentance. After just eight words. Here is number two, nine words, and he was more verbose than Jonah, Jesus. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And having said those nine words, Andrew, Simon, James, and John responded by abandoning their livelihoods, their families, and they embark on a journey of intense faithfulness to Jesus and the work. After just nine words. Now if you were to respond to my sermons like that at every point, <laughs> I promise you I will not go past 15 per week. But until then, <laughs> we, we have to deal with the hour and a half I planned this morning. <laughs> we heard Jonah's story. Well, we heard part of it. To remind ourselves as to how we got to this point, as we heard in the first reading, remember we are told in the story a whale swallowed Jonah. Well, the story goes that God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, a corrupt city, and tell them they had to repent. And that got Jonah quite upset. For he believed that they deserved destruction. There was no reason why God should spare them. And so he pouts and frets and, and runs away finally and got on a ship going to somewhere nowhere. The sailors got wind of it, that he was fleeing from God. And they, <laughs> as the storm arose and he was the reason for the storm, they believed he was tossed overboard. And the story is that the veil was there and the veil swallowed Jonah. After three days, the story goes, not my story, the story of the text, that the veil took him up on the beach and put him there, and he, after pouting for some time, finally he relented and went and proclaimed his eight-line sermon. He was so upset. He said, well, one short sermon is all you get anyhow. In Mark's Gospel, we have the story of Jesus as he began his ministry, finding persons who would share in that work. He goes out. He calls. And these persons responded and they embark on his mission, we're told, immediately. Well, perhaps 
perhaps they might not have gone right there and then. They may well have gone to complete a few things at home and return to Jesus. Whatever the case, Mark suggests to us it was an immediate response. Now we heard the letter from the first Corinthians where Paul suggests to them if you are married don't bother with that do not get caught up in, in, in this because time is short focus on what you got to do because time is short in each case there is a summons to do the will of God and we laugh at Jonah and figure, well, oh, there he goes again. Jonah, disobedient, wouldn't do God's will, and therefore God punishes him. And we think, what a bad boy Jonah was. But if we plumb the depth of that story, we will find Jonah's DNA in all of us we will find Jonah's DNA in all of us. Because how many of us, like Jonah, want to determine what God should do? How wrong God is? In Jonah's view, these people do not deserve a chance. They have earn whatever punishment they will get. And so reluctantly, like a little spoiled brat, he complains to God, you are so wrong, Daddy. You don't deserve it. That's how we are. Think about it. In so many ways, we are like Jonah. When we determine God, this is how these people should live. They should be just like me. They should have no other point of view but what the one I share. Liberals or conservative, male or female, gay or straight, environmentalist or developer, young or old, black, or white, Christian, non-Christian, the list is interminable. Once you are different to me, then God prefers you to me. And if God appears as if God has you in some kind of favor, God is wrong. And we believe only salvation is for one. And those like more. That was Jonah's problem. The disciples heard Jesus saying, The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. Follow me. What does that mean? That the God's kingdom has come near that Jonah's biases Jonah's selfishness Jonah's attitude to the, those who were not like him had to be challenged because the kingdom was a kingdom of justice of mercy of forgiveness of love of God's reign and rule being present in every way that all are in God's embrace. I have come that all may have life and have it in its full death. This is what they heard. This is what Jonah did not hear. I want to hear. Who will follow me? And they saw the urgency in the moment. They could not linger and tell God, well, that's not really how we understand this to be. That's not our perspective on these things. Let's examine the outcomes. Let's examine how we're going to get there. And let's see who, we, who will fit 
with our rules and our directives. No, no. They say they heard the message. God's rule is here. Get involved. And they could not but get involved. They could not afford to miss the moment that was made available to them. Thus Paul is saying to the Corinthians something similar. For, for, for them, God would return in Christ Jesus very soon. That was how they understood God's promise. And so they could not be delayed over the things that they thought were important. It may have been. But the more important thing here was not the things that they thought mattered, but what mattered to God in Christ Jesus. What were the important things that they were to pursue and to embrace and espouse? That's what mattered. And Paul says, marriage, material things, whatever you are, that's not critical really. This is more important. I will show you a better way if you, if you will. Now think about that as we consider our own call in Christ Jesus. The moment one is urgent. We have to engage in the work of God in Christ Jesus and where God is taking us as a people, as a nation, as a church, as individuals. What are the important things that matter here in our lives as a people? And if in our view there may not be what we want to do, have we asked God, is this your will, God? The hymn says, I love the hymn, Thy way not mine, O Lord. But we say, my way not, not thine, O Lord. And we want to make how it ought to happen. My friends, what I'm saying to us in this short sermon, this eight words, is this. <laughs> is this. We cannot presume to know the mind of God. God made us. God and God alone redeemed us. God and God alone sustains us. God and God alone calls us to engage in the work that is God's. What we need to do is to find out what that work is. Not what we think it ought to be, what that work is. That work is found in our gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim release in every way release of body, release of mind, release of attitude, release of all those things that imprison and captivate me. For, for ill that imprisons us for ill what we used to do what, what used to work they, but they used to work they used to be but hasn't time changed across the world things are changing so rapidly some for ill but a lot for good even in the church the sad story I um, saw on news this week, in England, there is a bishop chosen to be consecrated. Young man, his requirement is that no bishop who has ordained a woman should touch his head and make him a bishop. That's what a bishop elect, how he sees his beginning of his Episcopal ministry. And you say, what? I, I, heard, I heard you with your size. Yes, what? But he's only one of many of us who have similar views of other things. Don't think he, like Jonah, he alone, he, like many of us, have our own biases too, that are blind by, so, by our bigotry in every way, and are unwilling to say, Lord, what will you have us do 
I'll follow you. That hymn we just did, what a wonderful hymn, that, that opening hymn. What hymn is again? I'm number... No, 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 the four opening, five, the, the four opening four one. Five, Let me, five, give me the first, I mean, that, that's an amazing hymn. And if we, don't want it, it is built both musically sweet and lyrically amazing. An amazing hymn. I want, I want to end this with this way again. You call us, Lord, to be a people set apart. To feel with thoughtful mind and think with tender heart, thus chosen now, O Lord, we ask for faith in your unfailing grace to make us equal to the task. The task may seem difficult. The task may seem a bit beyond us. The task may call us outside of our comfort level and comfort zones. But we are called nonetheless. The call to Jonah was to leave your bigoted, biased mind to see the bigger picture. To James and John and Peter and Andrew to leave your security of house and home and, and livelihood to see the bigger picture. You call us, Lord, to serve, to die that we may live, to know we best receive. When joyfully we give, thus chosen now, O Lord, we ask for faith in your unfailing grace to make us equal to the task. If you, if we, if all of us will respond to the gospel call, to look beyond our blinkers, all of us, and see the bigger picture by sermons, with the only 15 words. <laughs> Amen.